That is what I was about to click. So, Alright, and I'm gonna oops, get the video mostly out of the way. <clears throat> Sorry. Alright, tonight the plan is to kind of review the last, well, not chapter 22, but 17 through 21, all the metaprogramming stuff. Um, and yeah, and Maya's ready to go. So hopefully I am too. Um, like I said in the chat, I'm not as prepared as I want to be, but then I got some time after work, so I'm a little bit more prepared than I was, but I still don't have like a thing for us to really sink our teeth into and go, but we'll see what we decide to do as we go. Um, so the structure I have is I went through and um, put on my learning science nerd hat and figured out like section by section, what was he trying to get across um, in these chapters? And so hopefully that'll give us a framework to kind of figure out how do we do. So without further ado, um, I mentioned it in the chat. It was really helpful doing this exercise and realizing that chapter 17, the whole point was to just introduce this stuff so it's not scary. Um, so I don't have a lot of notes on this. Is there anything here that doesn't make sense to anybody or isn't, you know, that you want to talk about more? So uh, one thing when I was putting the presentation together that I noticed is like, he's kind of restructured some of these bulleted points to like four or five points, uh, which is kind of what I did whenever I covered this chapter. But yeah, the core of this is still there, but I actually like the way he's kind of like uh, broken it down more into like quotation and unquotation and then, uh, you know, code as a tree. I mean, that's still one of the points here, but he's like, I guess, evolved the way he kind of projects yeah. the same points. Well, I think like a lot of that is covered in other chapters. Okay. Like here, you know, I said, recognize that an abstract syntax, or recognize an abstract syntax tree as a representation of a function call you don't have to as of this chapter like know what it means just this tree thing is a call um and just kind of accept that we're gonna later see that you can use our code to write code um in the context of a review like this this doesn't make as much sense because we also like know all the details of this now at least we've seen it so the whole point here is yeah okay we recognize these things. Now we're going to go look at other chapters and like really dive into every bullet that's here and do more. <laughs> All right. So chapter 18, this is where things start to get, well, a lot more complicated. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and go through these and break them down one by one for chapter 18 and 19. Didn't get that done for 20 and 21, but we can start. So, uh, the first section in 18 is all about these syntax trees. Um, you can use lobster to look at them. I think one of the main things in that to look at is just, uh, infixes are treated as the same thing as any other function call in R. Um, and then asterisk asterisk is a fiction. It, it gets parsed into caret. Um, and yeah, the same thing with the right arrow becomes a left arrow actually when the parser sees it. Um, what's, what's up with you doing back ticks in front of the exit and Y in that first, uh, example? Am I seeing that right? Is there back ticks in, in, around the variables? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I copy pasted real quick. <laughs> I don't know why those are there. Um, okay, I thought you were trying to show something there, but okay. Yeah, no, actually, I, I would I just copy pasted a, a few lobster calls out of the book. Um, all right, so there's no more chats about it, but th yeah, the basic idea is it's a tree. Um, I probably should have done a multi-level tree instead of these, but the idea is you know you can follow this tree that. At the top, you got the thing, and then you've got the the breakdown. And by the way, it's like it's the Zeringen, Sharingen, whatever ASTs are particularly ugly. 
Um, so question then, um, Darren posted a cool thing earlier from, I want to say it's like Ross Hacker or whatever. Why yes. is it that the plus, it's, why isn't the plus, like the first plus evaluated for that whole tree? Like, is it the curly brackets that separates a branch from that tree? Me, is that what happened? Yeah, well, kind of. So let's, let's try to get that in there. Um, if I can find the thing in threads with 1400 windows open. Okay, I'll post it into the Slack, uh, into the chat here. Okay, oh, thank you. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> well, That's great. Okay, so let's, uh, go take a look at, oop, oh, it didn't copy. Does it work? I don't think you can copy on the chat. That's aggravating, but it's not much to type, so I'll give it a try. <clears throat> Plus equals minus semicolon. Are you trying what? it live, or are you trying it like privately? I'm <laughs> typing it, and then I will share that okay. in a sec. All right. Just making sure you're not expecting to be sharing right now. No, not yet. Well, sometimes. I, I later I will deal with sharing, but sharing all right. Again. So, um, and actually, let's do Is this infinite room reader. No, I just refreshed. Okay. Um, the the ones get confusing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, the 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 curly braces are um, in the tree down here, and so that helps us find where we are. So the first plus is this plus this. So as of that plus, plus means plus. The second plus is uh, this plus this. So that plus still means plus. But then here, we get equals as an assignment operator, and it's plus gets minus assigned to it. And so at that point, now plus means minus for any plus below that on the tree. And that includes this plus because it's evaluated down here after the assignment. And it's crazy and it's one of those things of, well, that's weird, don't do that. Um, but it is, you know, it's a thing. Um, and that is part of actually kind of the overall metaprogramming thing of, you know, everything in R is data, you can re redefine what plus means. And that's crazy. Um, but maybe you have a use, uh, use for it somewhere. <laughs> yes, this is super insane. And I mean, it is from one of the R's of R. So it's not too uh, surprising that he knew of something weird that you can do. Um, and actually, I'm going to go ahead. Um, <laughs> going to go ahead and evaluate it and see if I totally break my session because now plus will mean minus. But only inside that curly session. No, only well, a curly bracket part. No. No, that gets it. Once you do it, now if like, um, if you look at, you know, if you do this and look at your environment pane in R or in um, in our studio, or actually, let me do this. Let's see what that does. Oh, it's a big mystery that we can't see. But if you do one plus one, you get zero, right? Um, so there we go. At this point, plus now means minus. <laughs> 
Um, and yes, this is a good example of where you would want to use local if for some reason you had to run this. Don't, because it's crazy and defining plus as primitive minus is crazy. And so I'm going to restore this to a somewhat less crazy state and rm that plus, but actually it'll still be there. Um, and I still want to show it in the slide, so I'm going to do that for now. I'll put a rm plus in later. Um, and so it takes a little, putting in the 100, there's probably a, a better way to do this with some combination of odd or prime numbers or something. But um, this, because plus got assigned to, or minus got assigned to plus, this is now 99. And then it's 99 plus one plus one, or sorry, it's, yeah, that is the only one where plus means minus. So this is 99, but then plus one plus one. So it comes out to 101 because all the other pluses are above that assignment in the tree. Did that make sense? Order of operations. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, the order of operations is on a slide coming up. So that's crazy. Don't do that. <laughs> So, but you can, like, that is kind of a neat thing about R. Like, don't do this, but I don't know. In Like, you, you can define plus for uh, strings. I think he does that somewhere else in the book, where you basically make plus mean paste, and then you're just pasting together strings. And if, it's, if you've got a use case for it, sometimes that makes sense. So, so why is it evaluated right to left? Um... So like, why is the last thing not affected, but the middle thing is affected? I'm trying to figure this, I'm still. <laughs> oh my God, I love the chat, the, my, the comment from Maya that we should make a package of functions for the, all these things that you shouldn't do. <laughs> I like it, because it's an opportunity to make another package. Uh, why it's from left to right, um, or, why it's in the order that it's in is actually an upcoming slide. I think it's in, it, yeah, it's coming soon. So we'll, we'll come back to that and probably jump back here to talk about it. But before that, um, <laughs> I called this objective out of, he, he really, like he, he had a good structure, but he's like, I don't want to talk about Paralyst yet. We'll do that later. So first he talks about everything except Paralyst. Um, I actually really like Tony's idea of like an Arlang just tutorial package. That could be fun. All right. Um, so, you know, you can wrap things in Arlang Exper or in quote and make expressions. Um, we're going to talk about that more in the expressions chapter. The, uh, the things that you get when you do that are constants, which are just things that, um, their symbol is themselves, so, or their, their, not their symbol, but their expression form is themselves. So expression null is null, uh, print says null, evaluates as null, it is null. Versus symbols, which are names, so like X or empty cars or mean, um, or Arlang or Exper. Um, and then calls, which are a captured function call, which, he defined it that way, and I found it very funny that, a, yeah, a call is a call, you know, it's a call to a function. Um, but the interesting thing that, I can't remember if I found it because of this chapter or just because I was poking around with Arlang, but the, the fact that calls are um, lists that you can subset calls, um, which we saw quite a bit, um, you know, we messed with this when we worked on factory way back in chapter 11 or whatever it was, 10, I think it was 10. Um, and, ooh, there's a big empty space on the screen. So it'll be, you know, there or whatever. It's down here. That's what chapter has the, uh, has when we talked about um, 
subsetting calls. Uh, anything in this? I mean, this was a bunch of definitions. <laughs> Bang banger. All right. Uh, all right. So uh, R has a parser, and the parser translates what you type into expressions, which are then evaluated. Um, so for for the order or the precedence, it's mostly math. And basically, he said, use parentheses when it's confusing. And I, I'm behind that. Like, yeah, there are some special orders, like the fact that you can put an explanation point at the beginning of like A and B, you can just put not at the beginning of that, but come on, wrap it in parentheses because people think you mean not A in B. Um, so I think that's a good rule, wrap things in parentheses if it's confusing. Um, and then, so associativity is the thing that explains this, that for um, everything except exponents and assignment, if you have the same infix operator over and over, it's wrap this in parentheses. And then, you know, if there were another plus, it would be wrap this whole thing in parentheses. It's you, you group it from left to right, and therefore it splits kind of from right to left. And that part didn't make sense until I really stared at it for a minute. So does that make sense, Tan? Since I you am, asked the question. I am, hold on, I am dropping out. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that, yeah. Does yeah, that answer okay. that? So yeah, that's why this, you know, this this plus is at the top of the tree because these two are basically as if they are wrapped in parentheses. And so you split there and then you split at this plus and then go from there. Um <laughs> and then the last part of this section, he talks about how you can take text strings and parse them using both rlang and base, but you shouldn't. And we talked about that a little bit on the channel today. I, I wish Maya had asked that question earlier because I totally want to do where you code all this stuff in basically in, I don't know, stringer or something, glue instead of in rlang. Um, and it'll break like it'll be dangerous is why you shouldn't do it because that's that's where you get little bobby drop tables um <laughs> so maybe i'll put that presentation together at some point just kind of separately uh it's bad <laughs> it's why you like you can do it but you shouldn't um it, the other thing is it's not just that it's bad is it you have to write some really complicated regex to get into the tree versus just let, you know, use the things that he taught us of walking the tree. Um, and I already ran into some of that when I was working on factory and I can't wait to get the time to go back and refactor some things and really properly use the walk the tree pattern that he goes over. Um, because splitting things up into the tree makes it a lot less confusing to find what you wanted to change. All right, and hey, <laughs> speaking of, uh, the next section was about writing those recursive functions to walk the AST. Um, and he didn't say this, but really, I think the takeaway of this section is he's got three really cool functions and then a pattern, copy those functions and then apply the pattern anytime you need to do this. Um, Uh, I'm going to come back to what Darren said in a second, but um, I, I did find the one use case of this. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the use case in a minute, but first I want to talk about that. Uh, Darren said that uh, I think the choice implementation of the associativity may be a, to reflect that addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are all left associative in ordinary math. Um, but only multiplication and addition are right associative. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, come back to Tony's in a second. So, 
Right. Oh my God, Maya, you are right. We'll talk about that in just a second because we totally should do that. Um, can you hop on the mic, Darren, and explain um, what you yeah. were saying? Well, what I'm saying is like, in terms of implementation, like they could have implemented it the other way, the, the associativity in the other direction. But in, in, in ordinary math, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll type it, let me see. <laughs> if you have, okay. Yeah, let me see, I'll, I'll try. Right, so, um, so, so addition and, and, and multiplication are, are left and right associated, right? Which means right. you put parentheses anywhere. Right. Right, so. Those are equal. And yeah, that actually does bring up a good point is the reason that that matters is purely for things like this. Like A plus B plus C is A plus B plus C. It doesn't matter where you put the parentheses, but if A is change the definition of plus, now it really matters where you put the parentheses because what do the other pluses mean? Um, and yeah, because it's not the same for subtraction, um, but you know, you have to know when some weird thing is happening and that's where code is different than pure math. So. Wait, what happens if you switch the signs? Does it change which associative direction it is? It doesn't change the direction. It just makes it matter. Um, but like, will R evaluate it differently? No, R will always do clumping from left to right, grouping from left to right, except for uh, 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 powers and assignment. Right. And so he has the it example too. It has to parse it first and then, then evaluate. Yeah. Yep. Right. And yeah, so specifically, it's the, the parser is doing this. Yeah. So, like, I think that they adopted it because that's the, that's the clumping to use the verb you use <laughs> that, that works for the basic arithmetic operations. Yeah. Right, left to right. That's what I think. That totally makes sense. Um, and, and it is, it's something where most of the time it won't matter, but that it's, I'm very glad that you found this um, example because it does really point out when it does matter. It's very, um, you know, contrived, but it's, it, it really shows the, you know, where it matters. And, and there are things that are much less contrived where you're changing the definition of a variable, for example, if you do it at the start, you know, where that, where that definition changes uh, will change what the code is, what it executes as. Of course, that with lazy evaluation, it's even more complicated than that. All right, so uh, Maya pointed out that we should PR flat map character into per, because he says it's a function that should be in per, um, which I thought like, I kind of see how it fits, but um, I feel like if it's going to be in per, you would need a whole flat map. Uh, you would like be personally family. responsible for 22 new functions called flat <laughs> map X or star or whatever. Yeah. So we should totally do that. That might be a project for uh, early days of the uh, R packages book club. <laughs> I don't think flat map two makes sense because because it flattens it, it's going to go all the way through. I don't I don't know. We'd have to play, but flat map int. I don't know what that would mean exactly. But does anyone else want pancakes now? <laughs> flat maps. Anyway, so yeah, he has that function, and then he he has the expression type and switch expression. Um, they're in the book. The base expression type lets you figure out what what is you know is it uh, which of these things is your expression plus pair list. Um, so which expression says okay if it's a constant do this if it's a symbol do this etc. Flat map uh, chr 
character or whatever it lets you just like run through a bunch of stuff uh it, it does the flattening um so you don't have to write weird iterations and then you have uh this skeleton that you can use for whatever you want to do that walks the asd now i don't know that that's a super common pattern but let me so go to um So if I, uh, oops, come on. I, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to find an example of this. And so I uh, looked at the code for lobster AST because that is the function that we know and love that walks the AST. And I thought, oh, well then surely it, I see that it calls this AST tree unexported function. And so um, it cuts off some of this here, but it doesn't matter because all we need is the top. And we see that he actually didn't use the pattern that he describes. Um, I think maybe he hadn't written that section of the book yet and didn't realize, oh, there's a nice pattern that makes this clean. So he has his own fancy thing. And plus he has to deal with closures because he made a new type of thing after this chapter. But the general idea is here that he's doing he's not he's doing it with a nested if instead of with a switch but um this is an example of actual code doing basically this pattern that he talks about uh it, in the in the book he uses base is dot symbol in his own code he used r langs is underscore symbol which i played around with and there is no reason to use this function unless you use its second argument, which he doesn't use here, because it's exactly the same thing, except literally 40 times slower than base. So just use base. But anyway, the base, basic pattern is here. Um, it, has an, it has an underscore instead of a dot. That's worth it. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, to a slight degree, uh, all the clean code, the fact that I mean, in this exact case, it doesn't matter, but like as underscore makes a lot of sense because those are all S3s. So as dot character dot whatever your class is, is messy as underscore character and then a dot. That looks nice. So yeah. Under, uh, underscore is also more typing. So yeah. Um, <laughs> It doesn't is, really is, is, is dot pairless and is dot call in the next. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and also, also, he uses is symbol without the R lang like prefix. And then right before, he does use the R lang prefix. Does he use it? You, are you saying in this code? Because I don't see it. Right there. So right there, he didn't yeah, prefix is underscore symbol with R oh, lang dot colon, but, colon. but right there, he did. So he probably uses is symbol a lot in lobster so he imports that somewhere but yeah um it's yeah it's uh it's interesting to to dig in and this is my favorite thing like when i'm trying to figure out how something works by the way just i typed lobster colon colon ast and i saw oh it calls this ast tree unexported function um and then go look at what that code is because it is the key example of walking in AST is <laughs> obviously is the function called AST. Um, we, I was happy that, you know, as of this chapter, you know, we were like, so like, when are you going to do this? Like, Oh, I know how to walk in AST. Now I can answer a question on a programming exam. But other than that, there's not, <laughs> Not a real example, but we saw that when we get to the um, LaTeX translator, it is totally walking the AST of a, a call to translate the call into a different language. So that is a definite case. And pretty much any time you're actually doing metaprogramming, you're going to be walking the AST. So um, whatever Maya's use case is, <laughs> presumably she's walking the AST. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so are there any questions about that pattern? I thought the pattern was cool. 
it didn't soak in the first time through. It soaked in a lot more after chapter 21. Um, I do actually looking at this code, this section comes before closures are introduced and I'll bet you would want to add that into expression type and switch expression. Um, because technically there's still calls, I think, but, um, they're fancy calls. So, all right. And then, oh, oh, cause that's code. I was like, why is that blue all the way through? All right. So then, then he just has this ch section at the end where he's like, okay. And then there were these other things I didn't want to talk about before, but okay. And I missed a asterisk there. Um, so <laughs> the, yeah, I, I agree actually going back on this, that the fact that there is some inconsistency here, lobster, I, I'm 90% sure he wrote 100% of Lobster. So um, it's not perfect. And knowing that sometimes Hadley code isn't perfect is kind of nice. Because <laughs> I'm fancy, Maya. That's why I can re-render and not get kicked to slide one. It's because this is a browser. I opened it up in a browser, not in the view Ooh. pane thingy from our studio. And the browser window has the URL of what slide you're on. So I just reload after I render. All right. Um, but yeah, the fact that it's imperfect is actually kind of nice. Uh, so the missing, the things that he hadn't defined way back at the beginning of the chapter, uh, pair lists, um, they're only, I think only formals to functions. Like he talks about there, it's pretty much all that's left. They used to be other places, but they've gone away. Um, does any, is there another case that I'm not thinking of other than formals? Um, not that I know. Yeah. So, um, well, and I guess technically a list makes pair lists. So the a list function lets you make pair lists, which you can use in defining functions, um, which I only know because of factory again, because of the weird use cases where you want to actually um, the main use case being when you want a missing argument. So that leads us to missing arguments. Again, basically it's like, look at the help of missing arg from Arlang. If you ever think maybe you want missing args. Um, I don't think it's something you really have to internalize from this chapter. Just they exist and it's a thing that maybe you have to look at sometimes. And then I, my favorite was he has the section on expression vectors. That's basically um, these exist and they're dumb. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, I did, so to be fair, they are a list of expressions. It's a special data type, a vector of expressions that you use expression from base R to deal with them. And um, the one nice thing is if you eval an expression vector, then it goes through the whole thing versus if you eval a list of expressions, it sees it as a list. It doesn't see it as a list of calls, list of expressions. Um, and you can do call or exec the list. Right, yeah. Which, um, same thing. But I, I think, you know, basically he was saying, but probably you wanna like do some sort of looping structure to go through that. So you know that you're doing that. Um, because it's a weird behavior, um, but that is a possibility. All right, so, okay, that's chapter 18. Uh, how, how does it feel? How do we, what do we think? How are we doing? So was the argument that if, if you do it as a list that it like evaluates each expression in its own environment they don't interact and then if it's a if it's a list of ex, if it's an expression vector then it all gets done in, in sequence um i mean that is an argument but also i i could see i could definitely see there being cases where you would want to do that um 
I don't know if, uh, you know, like... You now have a method for, like, regular lists. I think that's what he's saying. It's like you need to do do call or um, exec in order to use it. Because right. list doesn't have a method. Or eval doesn't have a method for just plain lists. I oh, think is what okay. he's saying. All right. Just, all right. Okay. Just, you have to handle it separately. Right. Yes. But I, I think... I think Hadley's point was, and then, you know, good, <laughs> you should handle it separately because you're evaluating code and evaluating a hundred different expressions is probably well, Okay, then, bad. then I would add this to the list of questions to ask Hadley is if he thinks that this is a stupid idea, why did it exist in the first place? <laughs> what Was there a reason that it needed to exist and then we've just moved away from it or was it always a bad idea? Yeah, I'd also be curious to um like search through like Arlang and some of the other kind of base um tidyverse you know the rlib packages that a lot of these things that he says you should not use this unless you are writing the package that replaces it because he uses some of these things um inside of Arlang. and so i'd be curious to see if he uses it and if so where and when um yeah all right, so 19, um, this is the one I did before, uh, and I didn't think of it in uh, learning objectives when I did it the first time, but here we are. So uh, he starts out with just kind of defining what quasi-quotation is, and we'll talk about that. Um, he talks about how you can quote expressions in R Lang and base R, which we did a little bit before, but he's, we're gonna do more explicitly here. Um, and then we get into the meat of quasi quotation where you unquote parts of an expression while you're building a quoted expression. Um, we'll go into the non quoting that is in base R. He, he calls it non quoting to differentiate it from unquoting because it's not quite the same thing. Um, we'll do some things with dots and uh, we're going to use Arlang. Uh, to generate some code in theory. And then um, there is a bullet about the history of quasi quotation that this bullet is all we're gonna talk about it because whatever it's, well, the one thing I, I did find interesting is this whole section that is about the history throughout all programming languages of quasi quotation has two paragraphs out of four are about Hadley and Lionel figuring out how quasi quotation should work. Um, I don't know that he's wrong because I don't know these other languages that have quasi quotation, but I think the fact that like, he's like, and then we got it right. <laughs> and so I thought that was kind of funny. All right. So what is quasi quotation? It's quotation with selective unquoting. It's where you can mix and you can, you can say this thing inside of this expression is this variable evaluated. Um, and it's what lets you generate, uh, you know, an expression that, mixes what you define and what the user passes in. Um, that's, does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so then he walks through how you can quote expressions in Arlang and base R. And I think it's funny because like his summary table shows expert and n expert and experts and n experts, but really there's also sim and n sims and there's, uh, you know, quo that we're going to get into later, which is another quasi quoting way to do it. But the basic idea, um, is, you know, anything without an en is what you type at the command line. Anything with an en you put in functions to quote what the person passed in to the function. Um, that's the basic idea. Uh, if it has an S on it, that's for many instead of one. So it's pretty straightforward. And this is where we get into why is Arlang cool? That to make an expression in Arlang, you use expert or an expert. Like, and it's got rules of how the functions are constructed versus in base, you know, you've got quote and substitute and a list and this incantation to the dark forces and it's just crazy 
um, code. Although I do kind of like that at least there's as list is related to a, no, there's no real pattern to this. So um, that's the idea. But um, a thing I keep consistently finding is if you can't figure out how to do something in R line, um, substitute is how you do some, like the thing you can't figure out how to do, substitute just makes it easy. I think um, I don't really go into it that much in the slides, but learning, <laughs> and yes, quote, easy. Uh, well, but it is kind of that substitute, you take an expression and then you say, I want some of the things in the expression to um, get some other value. We well, just pass in an environment where those things are defined and substitute says, oh, okay, I'll put those things into that expression. Um, and it's really relatively straightforward to do that uh, in a lot of cases. So a lot of cases, I mean, I don't have a lot of cases for any of this, but in cases, it is really clean code. That said, it's, you gotta do that one unique weird thing for that weird case versus you have a whole like language that they've built up in our lang that makes all of this kind of make sense, kind of. All right, uh, the next section is about selectively unquoting and mostly he goes into cool things that you can do when you do it, but the basics are bang, bang to unquote a variable, one thing, and then bang, bang, bang to unquote many things like a list or dots. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Any questions about that? All right. Uh, <laughs> and then Basar has all the crazy kind of quasi quotation. So quasi quasi quotation. Um, there's B quote. <laughs> there's B quote, which exists. And uh, he, I don't, you know, it, it has its own form of unquoting. Uh, it, there are some usage of it in packages. If you go like searching GitHub, but it, it's not widely used. Um, and then the other things for non-quoting are like, there'll be a pair of functions where one version of the pair you have to quote, the other pair you don't. So um, like dollar sign, just a, it evaluates whatever's to the right of it in context to the thing to the left of it versus brackets um, doesn't, they don't quote the input. Um, other times there will be argument pairs, like in RM, there's dot, 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 but there's also a list and the list it, uh, is uh, unquoted. The dots are quoted. Um, oop, I've got a typo. So let me... um, there are cases where an argument controls the quoting. So when you library, you can, um, you know, if, if I sent this in, it will try to library a package named package versus if I say character only equals true, now it's going to evaluate package to whatever is stored in there, like tidyverse. Um, there are some things that quote if evaluation fails. So he gave the example of help. There are a few other examples in the book that it tries to quote what you pass in. And then if that doesn't work, it's like, oh, then maybe that's a variable. Let me see what's inside of it. Um, and then in the plotting functions, <laughs> I just loved, uh, he didn't word it exactly this way, but he talks about how they follow the standard, non-standard evaluation rules. Um, and it is, you know, that is what's kind of ironic is that, you know, on this screen where there are all these different things to do, and then he says, these are the standard non-standard evaluation rules, but they're not that standard because there are five other ways to do it. Um, any, like, I, I don't know, for the most part, like, obviously, you know, you're going to use dollar sign and bracket and you're going to use library. But for the most part, I don't feel like, you know, B quote is the, the weird one and everything else just kind of follows and you, you learn it as you learn those functions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's 19.5. Wait, All right. So what are examples of like the 
standard and non-standard? <laughs> yeah. Is it just plot? It's just, yeah, it's plot it, or it's, so um, LM does it. It's anything where you pass in like a data argument and then every width, width would be standard, non-standard. Um, Subset. You pass, kind of pass in uh, an environment effectively. A data mask, I guess, really. And then everything else is in the context of that data. So like anything with a formula? No, it's anything with um, like a data argument. Let's okay. See. Where are we? Yeah. So like he, you know, he talks about um, in plot, you know, you, you send in data, data equals iris. And then after that, the, um, all the aesthetic arguments, the, the uh, call and CEX, uh, et cetera, look in iris for anything that you say. So if you say species, it's gonna look in iris. Um, and I, I should have transla <laughs> translated that because it's supposed to be penguins now, not iris. But, um, and yes, uh, Tan linked to the uh, PDF. Let's see. Did that work? Do, um, yes. Did, okay. So uh, yes, there is a standard standard of, or non-standard evaluation set of rules, which were standardized by our core, yes. Um, and it is, it is basically base R using data masks, which um, I hadn't thought about. Hey, John. So yep. data masks includes, is, is that like data plus closure or is it, um, is it kind of a cheat where you send in data, but with the environment also? I, so, um, I think the term data mask makes it confusing and someone can correct me if I'm missing something, but it's basically you use a data frame as an environment. That's all that data mask means, right? Does anyone have any other nuances that I'm missing there? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's how I would describe it, like a context. Like an environment is a context. So when you, and same thing with data environment, right? you're evaluating like a column in the context of that data frame. Right. And so, yeah, it's just saying that for, for everything else in this function call, this column of my data frame is what I mean when I type a vari this variable. Well, um, like, I think it means like you go there first to look for it, but like, yes. right? Yeah. Oops. Got it. And that is good to talk about because we're coming up on that chapter and I do, I have bullet points, but I don't have the breakdown. So um, we will talk about that in a second though. Uh, we have this chapter with the dots. I said it when in, I did this chapter the first time that this is kind of the mishmash chapter. But the general idea is that um, there are various ways to mix together dots and lists to supply arguments to functions. He's got a way in Arlang with exec. Base has do call. The idea is you give him a list or a um, tidy dots object that lets you combine um, dots and arguments. Um, there are various ways that different different functions do it. Again, you can refer back to the book if you like really want to go into it. Um, so yes, uh, that's basically that section. All right, and then I, I tried, I think I managed to fit this all in one uh, slide that um, the, then he actually shows like using quasi quant quotation to generate code. But in the book, it ends here because we don't have evaluation yet. This is the quasi quotation chapter. And it's like, and why would you ever do this? So I'm going to walk through it and then we have an actual like use. So he's saying, you know, let's say you've got uh, model parameters and uh, you can 
write code that turns those model parameters into an actual equation, like a function that you will call. So um, the general idea is we're going to take a bunch of things to sum together. First thing is the intercept. And then we're going to go through and take the names, so x1 and x2, and the actual values, 5 and negative 4. And we combine those together with multiplication, and we put each name, so the bang bang dot x is saying, I want actually x1 and actually x2. Um, and the bang bang dot y is saying, I want those coefficients into this expression that has a multiplication in it. Um, if I'd had room, I would have printed the result of that, but it's a bunch of, you know, it's like uh, this and this. Um, but it's still an expression. It's just the expressions came from this coefficients. Now, I probably should have actually, um, you know, you, the, the point of this is you can have a lot more coefficients and it's still just as easy to write this. Um, and that's the idea of writing code with code. Um, so we do that and then we use per reduce, which, you know, uh, has a billion uses that, uh, we're learning as we go through the book. Um, why map to instead of I map? Uh, because you want to do something to the names. Like, I think it would get confusing. <laughs> I mean, you could? You, 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 you would just change it to, I think, to you move the Arlang Sims into the right. app rather than. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, really, I think the main reason is, I think, I think I saw him say somewhere that he kind of regrets the existence of IMAP. Um, he rather, he'd rather that you explicitly choose to send the names in instead of having a separate function that is only for that case. I disagree. I think it is a common case. Like I want to do it all the time. And so, it's a very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I use IMAP roughly as often as I use map. So, um, that is, yeah, you totally could do it this with IMAP. Um, and then the idea would be, this would be bang, bang, Arlang, Sims, uh, I think dot y. y, right? Yeah, because yeah, the name's going as Y, but whatever, basic idea. <laughs> Maybe that's his regret, is that he didn't make it names and then value rather than value the name. Maybe. <laughs> All right, and so then we reduce that. We take the semans and we put it through this, uh, just add these things together. In reduce, the dot y is the the like previous thing. And so we're taking the new semand and adding it on. And that gives us this equation. That's 10 plus, uh, you know, 10 plus this thing that's from semans and this thing that's from semans. And the point of that is now you have an equation that you can evaluate in the context of whatever your actual values are. Um, and it works, it's an equation. It'll just do your math. Um, it is a somewhat contrived example, but really not that contrived. Uh, it's pretty close to a real use case. So I think that's pretty cool. And, but the, in this chapter, he ends here and it leaves it slightly contrived of, okay, but then what do I do? Like now I've got an equation, but I can't actually do anything with, with it. With eval, you can. Um, I did it uh, here actually with eval tidy because then I can just send it a list instead of having to turn this list into an environment that I send it. Um, <laughs> contrived as our package name, I like that too, with Kepler. Um, anyway, so that takes us to, I think that's it. Yes, so 20, I, I, so I go ahead. To say this, uh, this reminds me of like the intro calculator example to like any programming language, like, well, not every programming language, but you see often like to, in like tutorials where it's like, here, write this calculator app or something. Uh, this is like the equivalent of it for our language. <laughs> kind of is, yeah. Um, but it's like write a thing to make uh, functions effectively, you know, it's a simple function factory or certain type of function, but 
Um, yeah, I like it though. I think it's uh, it's elegant and clean. All right, so now we get into the sections where this is the only slide I have for chapter 20. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, before we go on that creating model formulas, you know, it, it isn't uh, contrived really. Like that is a useful thing to be able to do. You can use it, um, you know, there are other, other things to do, but just having the actual formula that you can just kind of see put your hands on it is kind of nice so part i think part of that is it's a, just the burden of the way the the model functions were developed they used this formula interface right that you would need to do something like this you know that they, they you don't have to do it this way like they they could have designed the function so you, you can give it the variables and the coefficients in separate vectors and they can just put it together on its own, but that's not the way R was written, not the way these functions were written. You have to produce the formula in a right. lot of cases. <laughs> All right, so yeah, it is, it's uh, an interesting use case. Now, you know, you can also just fit. <laughs> so there's that too. Um, all right. Uh, so yes, chapter 20. Um, this is the eval chapter. Um, the basic ideas that he runs through is that we look at how you can use eval to process expressions. And I, I had to find a word other than evaluate. So I, I, when I say process here, that means evaluate. It means you take the expression and actually execute it. I guess that'd be another way to say it, is you, you make it do its thing, whatever expression you have sitting there. So for example, if you have this expression of 10 plus x1 times five plus x2 times negative four, evaluation is run it. Um, oops. You can use eval tidy to evaluate closures, which is just a, uh, an expression and an environment. You don't, it doesn't actually have to be a closure as we see here. It can be just a expression. Um, data masks uh, let you send in variable definitions for tidy evaluation. Uh, in 25.5, he talks about like how to avoid some errors in tidy evaluation, which again, I think um, I would have liked to have made a slide about because I didn't go into the details of what that is. And I don't have that committed to memory really well yet. Um, and then the, uh, the last section, he kind of goes into like, yeah, you can do evaluation in base R, but these things go wrong. And this thing only works in interactive coding, not in functions. And this, I think 20.6 without explicitly being so is his, this is why Arlang exists, use Arlang section, um, because there are all these things that can go wrong unexpectedly in base evaluation. Um, so the things, like the big things about this is, uh, you know, it's been a while since we did the environments chapter, but this is the chapter where environments really like come into their own, I think. It's like, oh, Right. Okay. I need to know where I'm doing this because then I'm, a, I can, or I can tell it where I'm doing this and tell it my environment is all the definitions of these things um, that when I evaluate, they work this way. Um, it's really useful. It let, you know, chapter 21 was, had a big, a lot of things about how to use environments to make things work well. Um, yeah. And Tony pointed out that when we did the environments chapter, it seemed like it was out of place. And I think it, it was like, I don't remember really talking about environments between environments and our line. So whatever. Um, then the, <laughs> I, I still, I don't know. I think data mask is an overcomplicated term, but I don't have a better term, I guess, lined up, but that, it's just a way of 
supplying a list or data like, you know, this is a data mask. It is saying that here X1 means one to 10 and X2 means 10 to one. Um, it's a set of definitions. Now, usually a data mask is a data frame um, in tidy, but it's just saying, look into this, in this place for all these uh, variables. But then he has the pronouns uh, and actually that's what 20.5 is mostly about is uh, he has dot data and dot env. And I um, didn't used to be very good about always using them. And I've started in all of my package code when I use tidyverse functions to use dot data and dot env because then you don't, like it just gets rid of bugs that you can't figure out when you've got a column that's the same name as a variable and you think that you're saying, for example, filter where this column is equal to this variable, but you're actually just saying filter and only keep cases where this column is equal to itself, and then you don't filter at all. Um, so having dot data and dot env, just you, you avoid that problem. The big thing, like for me, it seems like dot data doesn't often change the behavior, but it changes the error messages. It makes you actually understand why it didn't work. Um, and then dot env actually changes the behavior. It says, no, 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 don't look at the one in the data mask, look at the one outside of the data mask, uh, which again, you know, like in my head, that's how it will work, but it's not necessarily how it'll work. Um, so, like, one thing I always wonder about is, I mean, some of the data mask structure is, artificial just to make this stuff work better, I think. I mean, is it, is it really any different than having some environment of named things that's a child environment of the environment you're, you know, that, that you want to evaluate? So putting an interview. Like functional events Yeah. Uh, so the, you know, the, uh, it's a little weird to me that like the data mass itself, the, the things it takes in is either a data framed or a named list or a vector like, or the output of as data mask or a new data mask. Like in, in reality, all it's doing is it's creating this, this other environment where it's going to look up names first before passing right. to the to the outer environment. So like why why is it necessary to have this different thing? And I I mean I I think it is just a easier to use version of environments. Like it makes makes more sense for a list or a data frame to be the definition of variables. And I think that's why they call it a data mask is that it's a data frame or a tibble or a list or whatever, that it is data, some data structure that is where your variables come from. Right. Um, right. And it's like, it is a much simpler topic than you, you would think you'd be getting in chapter 20, I think. Like when I first heard data mask, I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm not gonna learn that yet. I don't understand it. It's like, oh no, it's just, it's it's the data argument in almost any function that has a data argument effectively as a data mask. Like, I think the reason that they have an extra thing is because like a lot of the time you will have, you will have it already there. So, right. so, so the, so Arlang, takes away the work of you creating the environment. Right, right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, it's a concept, like, I guess, in order for you to understand how nice it is, you have to understand the higher level stuff, but it is itself fairly, like, basic yeah. and easy to use. Like, it I, is I, the I, whole thing about the tidyverse is basically I get, that it treats the data as a mask. Yeah, I guess I was just saying that the, the reason that they have this data mask specifically rather than just a child environment is because 
you need that data mask so that they can get this dot data pronoun to work. Like it, it, it needs to know that you're referencing lookup names in this environment rather than the parent environment. Like I, and if not for that, you know, all I see that the data mass being is I, I want to execute it in some environment and I want this data mass to be uh, to be masking to to overwrite the names of uh, some of the things that I'm going to be looking up. Um, yeah. And I don't, you know, you could do that entirely with environments, but if you want to be specific about whether I should look up the name in the data versus the environment, then you need it to know <laughs> to look in the data versus the environment. So that, that it's like the, the whole reason data mask is ex, exist is to make this date dot data pronoun and dot in pronoun make sense. I mean, I could go in both directions that I think those pronouns exist because like the whole the whole thing with the tidyverse is you just once you pass it in pass it data now you just use column names as if they're variables so like the data mask i think was there before it was formally there yeah like yeah <laughs> yeah but in, initially the, the the data mask idea wasn't there and it would just create a, a child environment that it would yeah. look up yeah. things in first but then it came to the you know this obvious uh <laughs> impasse where well crap what happens if i have a name conflict between mm -hmm. my data and the environment and i don't know i i want to specify which one to choose it from i i need some way to to make that explicit and that's when we come into creating this actual object a data mask a, a class a data mask right, um, right. and if, if it weren't for that then you wouldn't need to do this Yes, because you, you could just you could just create an environment where those the columns of your data frame are named vectors in uh, the environment. But like, isn't that also like more difficult to do? To create the environment? Y yeah. Um... To create the, the 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 environment to be a child of, right? I I I just feel like syntactically it's just easier. Like the real benefit of of tidy eval is is just that it's really easy syntactically. Yeah, I mean it's basically like an extra step instead of saying eval tidy with this data mask in this environment. You would just do eval, but you had to build the environment, and the environment yeah. is the thing, the, the the default evaluation environment, and then a child environment that contains your uh, right. So you would be creating. A you have to create the environment. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so the, uh, oh, yeah. the ID process takes care of that for you, plus some extra. Yeah. That's right. yes. I I, I concur. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, so 20.4, he talks about the concept of a data mask and he introduces the pronouns. And then 20.5 is basically, yeah, those pronouns, they use them. <laughs> Whenever you're coding with someone else's tidy code, tidy uh, or R line code, uh, it's just safer to use the dot data and dot env because then it'll sort out what goes where or what comes from where. Um, and because we have these two things that we can use, so um, that's helpful. Uh, he also then talks about like when to quote and when to unquote. And um, like, this is the section that I probably need to read a few more times because this is the wait, do I, do I bang bang this or do I not always, I think I've got it. And then I go to write something and I don't quite have it. So that, 20.5.3 is the section on, wait, is this quoted here or is this unquoted or will it be unquoted in the child function or that's what that section's about. So recommend, I highly recommend going over it a few times. 
Um, and then 20.6, again, he like goes into lots of caveats, but I think the, um, the, the basic takeaway is that there are a lot of confusing things in base R with quotation and, and evaluation. If you need to, or if you want, you know, if you, if you can't afford to import R Lang, okay, you can figure out these things in base R but they are confusing and dangerous and you probably just want to use Arlang because it's more standardized. And uh, I mean, it's confusing still, but it's less confusing than base. So that's the basics of that. Does anyone else or have any other questions about 20? All right. In 21, there were only the two sections, but man, are they meaty and cool. So, um, he, you know, it, he hides it as if these are just case studies, but they do each have a little thing that they teach. So the first one, 21.2, um, he goes through how to generate functions to generate functions to translate our code, but really whether it's translating our code or not, the idea is you're, he's making function factories here. Um, that's the basics. Like there's a bunch of other stuff that's happening, but it's basically he makes a function factory and shows how you can use it and how you can process a bunch of things through it and how you can do all that. Um, any, anything about that? Any questions in there? Any comments? Um, I think it was fairly, I mean, straightforward is not the right word, but he walks through like it's, it's really clean. Um, I like that there's also some, uh, like S3 worked into here of, oh, and then you make it as its own class. And that way, if you run the function again, you just return, you know, if it's already in the class, you just return it. If it's not in the class, you run it through the function. So I thought that was a neat, a nice use case. Um, and then 21 or 21.3 rather is where he did the LaTeX coding. And this one I thought was like way more r -langy than the other stuff because it's where he's really parsing the AST. He's walking through, you're sending it in as a function call to functions that don't exist. And then he translates, you know, pulls that apart and does translation on, on that. Um, he uses that, um, uh, what was the name of it? The, you know, the, switch expression um, function that he had introduced in uh, 18 and he actually applies it. And I thought that, I don't know, I liked this, this whole section. Uh, it did bother me that in 21.3.4, he talks about this trick from 20.4.3 and I still can't wrap my head around what, what that's referencing, but it's a neat trick. I think it's tight. So. It's LaTeX. That's how you say it. <laughs> anyway. I, I figured, what, it, what is the, when he does the switch expression, was it on the type of the expression or the class? It's on the class. The, so like, if, if that point, at that point, like, like, why is he not doing not, it as an S3 thing? It's not, well, okay. It's not, they're not all S3 classes. Like symbols, aren't, I don't think they dispatch, do they? Hmm. Symbol, no, I mean, it would show up as a, like symbols call or I think it shows up as like a class language. Right, yes. Expression. So he's not, he's doing it on is symbol and is call, which do their own, it's not on class, it's on mostly type of, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> The fact that it's on type, like if, if it were a class thing, then I would just do it as S3, but uh, I'm sorry. Has to go off the, type. the chat is amusing me. I, I work in publishing. I'm sorry. It's LaTeX. I can't help it. it is it's not an X, by the way. It doesn't have an X in it. It's a, it's a Kai, and Kai is not pronounced X. It's K. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. Yes, um, I, I do. I like the switch expression pattern. 
uh, my uh, uh, function um, replace thing will definitely be using that pattern when I go back and rewrite it because that's, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> and yeah, la tech. And that's it. That's all I've got. Other than, I mean, I could make a whole slide about pronouncing la tech, but I can't make it because it's hard to write in not la tech because it's got, you know, the subscript E and the Kai. Well, if you have the, uh, if you, if you have the, uh, uh, your DSL to convert it to. <laughs> I don't have it in, in the code, but. Um, and there's a specific LaTeX function to produce the LaTeX symbol, so. Is there? Yeah, it's slash capital A, lower A, capital T, lower E, capital X. Oh. Makes, makes the LaTeX la uh, name. Ooh, look at that. So. Hey, 